Let's go. So, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the sixth meeting of 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. However, you may notice some committee members consulting tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital format. We have apologies from Dave Thompson today, and we're expecting Angus MacDonald to arrive slightly later. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. And so the first item today is for members to consider whether to, to uh, the draft letter to the Scottish Government on its dairy inquiry should be taken in private at future meetings. Are members agreed? Thank you very much. We are agreed. The second item today is uh, for the committee to take evidence on the dairy industry from stakeholders. We have two panels this morning, both of which will be utilising video conferencing technology. I remind members that because of the technical aspects of the video link, a delay will occur between the members finishing their questions and the witnesses hearing them and responding. Equally, there will be a delay uh, the other way. Because we're using a video link, it's important that no one tries to speak over anyone else. Therefore, members should speak only if I call them to do so and should not try to interrupt a colleague or witness, as that would affect our ability to hear the answers. So I refer members to the papers just now, and, uh, which you had circulated. And uh, I introduce the first panel, panel, which is Christine Tacon, CBE. Grocery Code Adjudicator, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for being there. And James Courtney, Investigations Manager, the Grocery Code Adjudicator, also via video link. Good morning. Good morning to you. Um, we will now hear uh, from uh, uh, the panel uh, with some answers about their role. So... Christine Tackett, um, you haven't conducted any investigations so far, but you are now embarked on a particular investigation um, at the present time. We're looking at, the, at dairy products. Are dairy products part of your uh, uh, interest here at the present time? Uh, no, the investigation that I, I actually launched it today is into Tesco, yeah. And it is um, because I have reasonable suspicion that they have breached the grocery supply code of practice in the area of delaying payments to their suppliers and um, asking for payments for shelf positioning. But the code is only about the relationships between the direct suppliers and the retailers. So these delays in payments, if I can elaborate, explain that a bit more, is generally where the supplier has given the retailer the, the goods, the retailer pays for them and then deducts from that invoice for various reasons. And the issue that I am looking at is deductions which were not agreed by the supplier for, um, for promotions, for maybe in some cases duplicate deductions, um, and even some deductions without any areas at all. But uh, unless any of the, those suppliers, direct suppliers of dairy, and there are very few um, dairy business, dairy farmers that, that supply retailers directly, then they would not be covered by that investigation. That there are some uh, dairy suppliers who supply directly uh, in Scotland. Uh, and that they're in a, a charmed set of pool of uh, farmers and that there may well be individual ones. So does your investigation cover the subject of dairy products then? Uh, it definitely does. So any, anything that is you know, in, invoiced directly from that supplier to the retailer, that it definitely covers that, covers dairy products. And I have today issued a call for evidence, and um, there's a, a, about an eight-week period for people to submit evidence to me on those areas I've called for evidence on. But they can also let me know if any other retailers are doing the same practices, in which case it, I may end up having to extend my investigation as well. 
Well, we're very pleased to hear that because uh, we'll be taking evidence from other supermarkets and have already heard from other than Tesco about uh, this matter regarding our dairy produce. And we expect that uh, that might well be uh, the case for you to open up a much wider investigation, perhaps, than you had thought. Um, yes? Okay. Yes, I was going to say the investigation is just on those two areas of delays in payments and on um, shelf, you know, charging for shelf positioning. And one area which um, I really must emphasise, it is nothing to do with price negotiations, which I know is one of the, the issues that um, you no doubt will be wanting to address. I do not have any powers in that area as to whether the price being paid is fair. I do get involved if there has been a, a, break, a breach of the contract of what has been agreed. Well, you've been in existence as the adjudicator for about 18 months, and it's for some of us, the belief that uh, penalties and so on are something which uh, are important to giving you clout um, have taken a long time to be agreed. Um, do you expect to be able to use these powers in order to make uh, this uh, process more transparent? Um, the... I had, to, I had to write a recommendation when I came into office as to what I thought the maximum level of penalty should be, and only when that has been agreed by Parliament do I then have the power to fine. So at, although the instrument, is, as you probably know, has, has recently been laid, and they have gone ahead with my recommendation, which is that the maximum penalty should be 1% of the retailer's UK turnover, which is a ver very large sum of money. That's hundreds of millions of pounds for the, for the largest retailers. Um, but in this particular investigation I've launched today, which is only from breaches from when I started to today, I will not have the power to fine because that statutory instrument hasn't gone through. I have other sanctions, but the, 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 I think I should also say that the sanctions that I've had and not having the power to fine has not stopped me working with the retailers, having quarterly meetings with them, raising issues I'm hearing all the time. And I'm also hearing from suppliers that some practices are being improved. So I have been making progress um, because they all know I'm going to get that penalty. And it was my, it's, it's the ability to have it that was important. The potential for your uh, inquiry to take some time might actually overlap the time that it takes to pass the parliamentary order to put the... the, the, I, the I, yes, I, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, the, the breach needs to have occurred um, but what, when, when the penalty order has been laid and I'm only able to take evidence of breaches up to, from when I started up till today. What a pity. Um, can I introduce my colleague, uh, Jim Hume? Um, thank you, and good morning. Th thanks very much for uh, coming along. Just a, a couple of points. It would be great, interesting, firstly, to see which sanctions that you can use if there have been breaches uh, uh, at this point, before I go on to my main question. Um, the, 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 I have three sanctions that were laid out in the Act, of which one was the financial penalties, and that is the ultimate sanction. The first one is to have legally... If I find a breach of the code, I clearly have to find a clear... establish that first, is I can make legally binding recommendations on the retailers I've investigated, which will be likely to do with the processes... In, in ter, you know, if I'm looking at the delays in payments, it may well be internal processes. They will become legally binding on them. And, of course, having done that, I can then do guidance for the rest of the retailers. So what I learn from one retailer will actually hopefully spread across others as well. Um, and my other, the, the next sanction is name and shame, which um, it's not called that, but, you know, sort of requiring people to take out, the retailer to take out national um, advertising, apologising for what they have done. And uh, the retailers have argued very much that their reputation is the most important thing to them. And they argued I didn't need the financial penalties. They felt this was a big enough sanction. I will have both those recommendations and sanctions uh, and name and shame in my sanctions for this investigation. Well, that's great, and I'm glad that the UK government has taken up your recommendations of, of the 1% turnover. Uh, you said that you've actually do have the powers to look into the, the dairy se uh, sector if there have been issues of breaches of contract uh, there. I, I just wonder if that, that has actually happened, if any issues have been risen from suppliers or for farmers, uh, and if not, uh, if you could give some examples, if possible, of some of the issues that have been raised uh, to you uh, to this date, apart from the one you just mentioned. Yeah. 
Um, most of the issues that I've heard on the dairy sector have been from the, the farming community and their representatives and their trade associations about, about pricing. Um, and that's not an area I can get involved with. Firstly, it's about price. And secondly, they are, in the, in the main, not direct suppliers to the retailers. I have not heard any issues raised by direct suppliers to, to, uh, of, of retailers to... Uh, sorry, I've not heard anything from direct suppliers to the retailers, apart from an area that is in my top five issues that I have been working on for 18 months, which is the drop and drive, where people, particularly in the chilled chain, say they will deliver what they believe to be, for example, 100,000 units to a retailer depot. They get no proof of delivery. They send an invoice for 100,000, and what comes back is an invoice for the 100,000 less 20,000, which the retailer said weren't on the lorry. And I've been calling that drop and drive. So they've got no proof of delivery to be able to challenge it. And that comes under this heading of delays in payments that I am now currently investigating. That that's, uh, sounds quite fair. Well, I, I will say uh, shocking, to be honest, if it, if, if it is uh, allegedly true, of course. Uh, just, I suppose, uh, just a couple of other things, really. Um, you... No, I think, I think that probably covers it all just now. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. I'll I bring in my Thanks. colleague, Graham Day, to ask a supplementary. Uh, good morning. I, I just wonder, the, the investigation that you've launched today, albeit these are allegations, there's nothing proven, do you think there's a potential here that this will perhaps empower suppliers to come to you with complaints about other supermarkets, other uh, retailers? Do you think this might just be the start of a process that... that broadens out beyond simply one retailer? Um, f firstly, um, I I'm not launching an investigation based on allegations. I am launching an investigation based on reasonable suspicion. And when um, Tesco had their profit misstatement, a, a report was commissioned by Deloitte, and I asked Deloitte to include looking for breaches of the code when they did that, which they did, and there were some indications in that report that asked, made me ask Tesco to do a further investigation, which they did, um, fully looking into it, and they reported back to me. And so th that, that report, plus what I've been hearing from trade associations and direct suppliers, is what has formed my my re decision to investigate. So, so, sorry to spell that out, but I do have to have reasonable suspicion. And for future investigations, I think it's a really strong message I need to give to direct suppliers. I do need more than being told something over a dinner. I do need information and evidence in order to trigger these. But when I'm in investigation mode, which I now am, I can require any information I want from, from the retailer involved, so that will be te Tesco, and from that information it will indicate to me suppliers that I need information from, so I can then legally require that information, might be emails, might be contracts, um, um, or even witness statements from those suppliers as well. So. I've currently, when in opening an investigation, I go into a call for evidence. So now anybody can come to me with evidence, but I will myself be going out and legally requiring information to support all this. And if in those, either of those processes, other retailers are implicated, and I have, again, reasonable suspicion to do it, it will be expanded. I hope that answers your question. And so there's uh, one, one point I do want to make. I have a legal duty to protect the anonymity of all suppliers involved. So any evidence that I require, legally require, I need that, but it will never get out to the retailer. Okay, thank you. Bring in my colleague, Mike Russell. Thank you. Just if I could pick up something you said just now. You said that you would be, you're now inviting people to come to you with information regarding these matters, and you seem to imply that those people who would be direct suppliers, of course, in our case, therefore, that would be farmers directly supplying to supermarkets. You would also welcome that information, you seem to indicate, if there were allegations of similar action involving other supermarkets. Did you say that? I did. Okay. Yes. So, so this, inv this, this investigation, which you are launching into Tesco, is also has the potential to be an investigation if direct suppliers come to you or others come to you, an investigation into other supermarkets? For, yes, for, on those two areas, you know, on the on delays those, of payment, the things I'm areas. calling for, definitely, yes, it does. Uh, but, uh, and I have to have, re, you know, I would need more than one or two people, but mm -hmm. yes, please, yes. So and I think are... I do encourage suppliers to talk to me. 
if we are just, I'm sorry to labour this point, to be absolutely clear. If there are direct suppliers, and in our case that would be farmers who are direct suppliers to supermarkets who have allegations in these areas, they are open to come to you. Yes, uh, and, but and to be honest, uh, yes, but they are at any time. Okay. But, you know, they can always come to me if they're a direct supplier and talk about things. But this particular, yes, even more so now. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Alec Ferguson uh, has a somewhat similar point. Uh, good morning, Ms. Tacon, and thank you for joining us. I had, uh, I had an exactly similar point, actually, but it's just been neatly taken from me. Um, but I wonder, if I, I wonder if I could just um, explore a, a slightly different aspect of this relationship of direct milk suppliers with, with, with a supermarket, which is really um, in, in return for the direct supply contracts, which tend to give these producers a better rate than the normal market rate that is going. Um, they are expected to meet certain standards of animal welfare, for instance, um, a different environmental standards, and um, in some cases share data on farm performance as part of that contract. Now, I, I was simply wanting to know whether those aspects of a contract would come under uh, uh, come under your remit uh, as the adjudicator? Um, I, I think I need to clarify, being a direct supplier to a retailer d um, is actually about you're the person that invoices them, not that you're in that retailer's milk pool. So, you know, if that, if that supplier supplies to Muller Wiseman, then Muller Wiseman are the direct supplier. So just to clarify that, to so make sure so you're not misleading you into thinking that I'm covering any farmer that thinks they're a direct supplier. If they're not doing the invoicing themselves, they're, they're not covered by my code. Um, but in, if there were farmers that were doing exactly that, that would really be about their contract negotiation. And I would be interested if they felt they'd negotiated something with a retailer and the retailer varied those terms without giving proper notice or did it in an unfair way. That is the sort of thing I ask people to tell me about generally at all times. That's exactly uh, the I, I, if I, yeah. I, and, and sorry, I wanted to make an, another point is that... Um, the, there was, I think, a misunderstanding in the EFRA committee that I couldn't take, um, have issues raised to me by indirect suppliers. I can take issues from everybody, from trade associations from, and from indirect suppliers, anybody that wants to, can give me information if they think there is a breach in the area that I do cover. So an indirect supplier can say, I think... XYZ retailer is putting pressure on my processor and that is coming down to me and I believe that I've got reason to believe that the code has been broken. That is a very useful clarification. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I move on to uh, Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, we've been made aware through adverts um, in newspapers um, which compare the prices that farmers get for milk sold in different supermarkets to the cost of production. And the advert said that the cost of production for a four-pint carton of milk was 68p and that farmers would get more than this for milk sold in three supermarkets, Marks and Spencer, Tesco's and Sainsbury's, but the farmers would get less than this for milk sold in Morrison's, Asda, Lidl and Aldi in Iceland. And the details of amount that farmers had received for milk sold by Waitrose wasn't available. Um, we're interested in whether you're aware of evidence that some supermarkets are paying suppliers below the cost of production for liquid milk. And in that circumstance, what recourse would suppliers have um, to be able to address that issue and to raise it with you? Um, whilst I... I've seen the same adverts and I follow the same stories uh, because it's, it's an area of interest to me, having come from, from the farming community myself in my last job. This isn't an area I can get involved with. I really have no remit on price. The only way I can get involved is if the, the milk processor that is supplying is saying that their contract has been varied without notice or that, um, that the code has been breached in some way. So I'm, I'm, I have no remit in that area. So what would be, what would be the, the way for um, farmers or suppliers um, to actually raise that issue? Just through uh, adverts? It, it's, not, it, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not with me, and I, I, have to say, I know that they're, they're doing a very good um, publicity campaign on their issue, but it, it's, it's not something I can get involved with, I'm afraid. So it's just for 
rival supermarkets to highlight that to members of the public so that we can take a decision based on price, quality and where we're buying our milk? Well, I, I, don't think I, I don't think I should be commenting on that, but um, I, I, get my, I get my milk delivered to the door and pay a proper price for it, and I think uh, more people should try and do that, but that's, that's nothing to do with my role, I'm afraid. OK, I think it just, it's just quite helpful to us to actually raise these issues, because I think people don't have any sense of how this works. And I think some of us right. have been really surprised to go into supermarkets or even corner shops and see the incredibly low price of milk. Um, and then compare that with the coverage we see in newspapers about the cost of production, even with incredibly efficient farms. Thank you. Um, we follow on with uh, Mike Russell with a substantive question. It, it, it is about information rather than, than complaint, and I suspect your direct remit doesn't cover this, but I think given your background uh, in terms of the work you did with the co-op, you will understand this, and it would be helpful for you, if you can, to comment on it. And the issue really is the transparency of information that is available. Dairy Co, of course, used to publish data on processor and retailer margins for liquid milk, but its website actually now says that it can't do so because of the consolidation within the dairy sector and there isn't enough reliable data. Now, clearly, your decisions on, if hypothetically, on the question of uh, contractual relationships would be, to some extent, based on the data that is available to you. Do you believe that there is a lack of transparency in the data in this sector or in any of the sectors that you deal with? I, I think you've, you've caught me out. There's not really an area that I can comment on. Um, I, 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 really, I really don't know. It's, 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 and I'm, I'm out of date in terms of dairying. I think I was last in dairying 12 years ago. But it's, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's, not, it's not relevant to my role and I don't feel I can comment on it. I, I just don't know enough. I just wondered whether the availability of trans... Well, let me put it more widely to see if, if you have a view on this. The availability of transparent data on costs and prices must influence the decisions that you will reach on whether or not supermarkets are behaving correctly and according to the code. Where do you get that data? Yeah. Um, no, my, my office very clearly is supposed to respond to issues raised to me by the industry and by direct suppliers. So I don't proactively go out and do things. I am responding to, to issues that are raised. So I'm not sitting studying data looking for, looking for evidence of the code. I'm responding to people telling me that, that there are problems. But the data that you receive then from supermarkets or others... Uh, that's the data on which you would make decisions. You wouldn't proactively seek other data to see whether, to be blunt, they were telling you the truth or not. Uh, I, I think, so certainly on an ongoing basis, I am just having suppliers talking to me about things that are happening. I then generally try and push for evidence, but generally I'm sort of looking for invoices or paper trails. It's nothing to do with the transparency of pricing data or anything. So like in the delays in payments, I've asked for copies of invoices where I can see deductions with no accompanying paperwork or where I can see duplicate invoices. So the data I'm looking for is particularly on the area where I have anecdotally been told by enough people that there is an issue and and uh, therefore I'm asking them to give me evidence because only when I've got that can I then move to a next stage of investigation. So, no, I'm not looking at market transparency data or um, th that sort of thing to look for breaches of the code. OK. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, my colleague Claude, Claudia Beamish will now ask a question. <laughs> Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, look, look into the future... Um, could I ask you about um, your remit and whether you, have, uh, you are able to give any views on whether it would be possible for it to be extended? I, I note that at Prime Minister's questions on the 21st of January of this year, that Glyn Davis MP asked the Prime Minister whether in the light of the current difficulties in the dairy industry, the powers of the Grocery Code adjudicator, yourself, should be strengthened. In his answer, the Prime Minister said that it was time to look at whether the adjudicator's remit could be extended to make sure it looks, more, it looks at more of the dairy industry. I wonder if you are able to express a view on that. Uh, 
Uh, well, I, th I think the answer is that I, I don't think it's appropriate that I do express a, a view on it. Um, but uh, my job is very clearly defined by, you know, in the in the Act, and also the uh, the code has been written by the Competition and Markets Authority. What flexibility I do have is that if I come across. Um, areas which haven't been covered by the code, which I think should be, I can make recommendations for the code to be amended. That is the only bit of flex I have within my power. But they've also made it clear to me that they may have to do their own investigation in order to extend the code. So they've asked me to try and work within the code as it stands. And a lot of the code, I mean, for example, the one I'm now investigating on no delays in payments, you can put a lot of things underneath it. But I think that certainly my understanding of most of the issues with the dairy farmers is actually about the price that they're paid, not about breach of contract. So even if the remit were extended just as the code as it stands, I'm not sure it would actually address the issues that they've got. Right. Uh, thank you. And in view of that, um, would, would you see that... Uh, it would be possible, uh, in, in view of what you're saying about the recommendations that you're able to make, which is an interesting point that I wasn't aware of until you highlighted it, which does seem to be quite a strong power, um, in, my, in my view, uh, at first thought. Um, would it be possible for you to consider, in view of the uh, difficulties being experienced through the supply chain, that um, you might put forward a recommendation about price that you should be able to consider looking at fair price? Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced that I wouldn't be able to make a recommendation on that. Uh, and particularly if I was looking at no delays in payment, I might be looking at internal processes that caused it and therefore saying, well, you should no longer allow buyers to be able to make these changes because that, that is causing delays in payment. So it would be about specifically addressing that issue that I had investigated. Uh, so I, I really don't... I think that would be a, a, a too wide a stretch of what I'm allowed to do. And uh, thank you. In, in relation to the, the whole supply chain, is there anything that you think might be able to be extended in terms of... Um, giving more of, a, more of a hearing, or a hearing indeed, to the suppliers, um, to the producers uh, in, in, say, in dairy, which we're looking at in our investigation? All, all there is, which is not under my area, is that there is an EU voluntary code of practice. And that is uh, the, the issue that I'm, I'm working on, regulating on. You know, we, are, we in, in the UK have been one of the first in the world to do something about this. So I just yesterday had a delegation from Southern Ireland who have got regulation and they're trying to learn from what we're doing to see how they can do theirs better as well. So these are, these are global issues. And I was um, two weeks ago at a workshop in Brussels where they were looking at whether they should be regulating. But they do have a voluntary code and their voluntary code is very much drawn up along the lines of ours, and it does go the whole way down the supply chain, but it requires people signing up to it, and there are, there's no, nothing like the sanctions that we've got, but there are trade associations that will come and get involved. But given that it's, mesh, it's mirrored on our code, it is about breach of contract, again, rather than um, fair share of price going, going to the producer. But that, that is something that exists. I don't hear it talked about very much in the UK, but clearly is an, an EU initiative. And some of our retailers, of the retailers themselves, I don't know about the producers, will have signed up to it. Thank you. You? Convener, it, it, just really looking a, a little bit deeper into that, and I appreciate you, you can't look at uh, contracts where the prices might not be fair, but they are contracts where two, people have agree, uh, two bodies have agreed, which is fine. But uh, regarding yourself as the Groceries Code adjudicator, would you see powers being put throughout the supply chain? Because we've heard yesterday from some supermarkets that, well, it's not them that make the prices, it's the processors that make the prices and, and the contracts between the farm and producers. Would you see powers uh, to yourself be useful uh, so that you could uh, investigate right across the supply chain rather than just those who supply the, the supermarket directly? 
I don't think that's for, for me to decide. You know, at, at the moment, you know, I have a small team. My 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 whole office of, of five people, in addition to me, of which I'm I'm part time. We are totally funded by the retailers, so it's a, a levy on the retailers that pays for our office. So I think any extension to that and the way it operates is something that. I am assuming we'll have to have primary legislation, so it's it's not an easy move from where I am now because it's very much set up to, to regulate those 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 well the ten retailers with turnover of over a billion. It looks like we've got a few more that are coming up to that category as well, but um, so it might be more than ten in future. But that is all it is. No, thanks, Alec Ferguson. Um, yes, thank you. Um, it it was put to us yesterday in evidence that. Um, when things get tough in a certain sector, there's a temptation to head towards the uh, grocery code adjudicator, um, but that to expect the adjudicator, i.e. yourself, to sort out the problems of the individual dairy farmer would be totally unrealistic. Is, is, that, is, that, something, is that a position you would recognise? Uh, yeah, if that dairy farmer is a direct supplier then I would be interested in hearing from them. And um, we've, we freq- I think what I've, what I've tried to say to people is if you're the only person that raises something with me, then that makes it very difficult for me to talk to the retailer because I have a duty to protect your anonymity. So in cases where people are coming to me with, with a problem where they think there's been a breach of the code, I will frequently refer, refer them to the groceries, um, to the, sorry, the code compliance officer that each retailer has to have by law. And those code compliance officers are not allowed to be in the buying chain of command. So they're generally in legal or in audit or they're the company secretary. And they know the code is law. And if the supplier goes to them with an issue, then they tend to resolve it. And they actually have to report to me annually on everything that's come to them. If they can't agree that, it comes to me to arbitrate. And when I arbitrate, I can award compensation. So I think most of the retailers are desperately trying to sort things out before they get to me, although I do have two arbitrations running at the moment. But I will, I'm always there for a direct supplier. It doesn't have to be part of an investigation. But um, if they want to get immediate, if they want to get redress and get it sorted, they will have to go to the code compliance officer and get that one sorted. The alternative is that I get enough information and launch an investigation. But in investigation mode, even if I'm at the stage where I can order pe- have penalties, there's no compensation involved. The penalties go to the Treasury. Can I, can, thank you very much for that. Can I, can I just ask you if you can answer this. Have you, have you, any, have you ever received a complaint from a, a direct dairy product supplier? Um, indirectly, in terms of the what I called the drop and drive earlier on with deductions from invoices for the fact that they were, they were um, not getting paid for everything they thought they'd put on the lorry. And that has come to me through... The, I mean, the, it comes through trade associations as well. So the Provision Trade Federation is one of the areas. And I, I really encourage trade associations to engage with their members and bring issues to me because... By the time a trade association has mentioned it to me, I've clearly not only got a protection of anonymity from people, because there is a huge fear of people that it will somehow get out, but also I know that it's significant if a trade association has raised it, because it will be more than one member. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for your answers. I just uh, want to go back to a point that uh, we raised at the beginning about uh, your potential to raise investigations at your own initiative. Um, could you be clear about that for us? Um, I have to have reasonable suspicion to launch an investigation. Um, and uh, if, I, if I don't do that, I can be taken to judicial review. I can be challenged by the retailers. So I'm obviously very careful to make sure I do, do that. Um, and that is why a lot of the area I've been working with, where I haven't had enough evidence to give me what I would call reasonable suspicion, why I've been working collaboratively with the retailers over the last 18 months, and I've had my top five issues that we've been looking for progress, and worry, you know, they report back to me every quarter on their progress against those top five. One of them's now been sold, so I've added a new one to my top five, and I know that the retailers that I've... I've been told, uh, uh, you know, have got issues in these areas, because they haven't all, um, are making progress on it. Sorry, who are the top five then? Uh, 
Right. Um, the, well, the one that I've solved was what I've called the forensic auditing, which is when the retailers are using no-win, no-fee auditors to go back. This is actually allowed under contract law to go back six years, and they were frequently using any scrap of evidence. They were doing very sophisticated software through emails going back six years, looking for evidence that the supplier might owe them some money and then whacking them with an invoice for it, and in many cases then um, threatening to deduct it or actually deducting it um, from, from payments that were due, under this no delay in payments that I'm currently investigating. And I had so many complaints about that that I um, asked the retailers and said, surely you've got systems that should be able to sort this in the current financial year plus two, and um, eight out of ten of them have agreed to do that. So I've now taken that off one of my top five, but that was a main one where I had a major progress. The drop and drive, which I was explained earlier, was another one. Um, forecasting was another. Um, many of the uh, retailers will uh, fine uh, or issue penalties for short deliveries, and I've been challenging them on, well, what did you forecast? Because if you forecast 4,000 units and they gave, and you then asked for 6,000 when the order came through and they gave you 5,900, you cannot, you, I mean, we all know the weather changes and things change, but you cannot then find them for that 100 they didn't manage to pull off. And I, they're now all, all of the retailers have got a big piece of homework from me on forecasting on what, what their figures are and how accurate they are. And interestingly, I'm hearing from some retailers, they haven't even got systems that talk to each other to compare their forecasts to their orders. So they're now all doing some work on that. Um, another area was demand for lump sums, which I hear very, very frequently. Some of them sort of uh, sort of swept up into sort of end of year margin maintenance agreements, but or, or just sometimes, you know, we've got a black hole we need to fill, we, we, we need some money. And well, that, that's obviously a significant one. And then another one that I think people found more annoying rather than being hugely prohibitive is being overcharged for artwork or photography that the retailers were telling them who they had to use. And then also then for packaging, if you particularly own label fresh produce. Um, where you, would, you, know, you had a preferred supplier list of one who charged the supplier more than they thought they could get it for externally. And having dropped the forensics off my top five now, I've now introduced the cost of customer complaints, where if somebody takes back one, one carton of milk and says this milk was off, the retailer will generally give you your money back and another carton of milk, but they will then trace it through to the supplier and probably charge them £45 for the, um, for, for, for the complaint, which um, when we know what they've received for it, you can see is a lot. So they've got another piece of homework justifying to me what they're all charging for customer complaints. And these are the issues I've been working on for the last 18 months. Haven't needed investigations because I've been getting progress on them. Haven't needed the penalties. But obviously all of those are part of my armoury when I need them. Thank you very much for your evidence. Uh, some of us are long enough in the tooth to have been uh, around at the time when we gave evidence for the Competition Commission uh, long, long before you ever got this post. And it is absolutely a major insight for us at this time to see the kind of work that you're doing. And we thank you very much for your evidence today. We noticed that behind you we've been hearing a lot of blue light activity um, uh, which uh, has been passing by. We just hope it's nothing to do with the Grocery Code Adjudicator. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. We'll suspend just now uh, for a few moments to change over the panels.
Hi, Mr. Sinclair, can you hear us? Uh, great. Um, I've, have you got control of the camera there at all, Mr. Sinclair? Well, we'll reconvene our meeting just now. My name is Rob Gibson. I'm the convener of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And uh, we welcome to our panel uh, Duncan Sinclair, the, agricultural, uh, the Agriculture Manager of Waitrose, who's on the video link. Uh, Steve McLean, the Head of Agriculture and Fisheries in Marks and Spencers. Um, Callum Kirk, the Category Trading Manager at the Cooperative Food. Um, Tom, Tom Hind, Agriculture Director of Tesco's. Uh, Richard, Rich, John Richardson, uh, Group Buying Director for Aldi. Um, James Bailey, the Business Unit Director for Packaged Goods in Sainsbury's. And Bjorn Neerhaus, uh, the Senior Buying Director for Lidl. Good morning to you all, gentlemen. Uh, and remember that we are dealing with the situation where if we're involving uh, Duncan Sinclair, that we have to wait for a while before he replies. <coughs> Excuse me. So I know that many of you may wish to, to answer the questions, but uh, we have a limited time and uh, we need to have short answers if at all possible. So. We're, we're interested particularly at this stage about what farm gate price uh, you pay for milk and whether you pay this to all farmers or just to those in a select group. Anyone indicate who wishes to answer that first? Yes, uh, the sound is automatic. Yeah. Um, yes, um, good morning, convener uh, and committee. Um, at Marks and Spencers, we have a dedicated segregated uh, pool of farmers. We work through a national uh, pool structure, um, and all the milk in our Scottish stores, both the, the retail milk um, that uh, sold in cartons, the milk we sell in our cafes, and the milk that we use in hospitality comes from a dedicated segregated pool of producers. The price that we pay currently is 34.256 pence uh, per litre and that price is derived through an independent uh, payment model which is reviewed um, every six months with the producers. Thank you. Callum Kirk. Yes, thank you, Convener Committee. Um, we have a dedicated farming group um, which um, is based upon two independent cost of production models and one base market model. We currently pay 29.84 pence per litre, which is a, 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 a premium. Thank you. Tom Hind. Morning, convener and committee. In terms of Tesco, we have a dedicated, segregated relationship with uh, over 600 dairy farmers uh, across Great Britain who supply all the milk for our fresh milk, cream, and mature and extra mature cheddar. Um, that's a relationship that's um, been in place since 2007. We currently pay a milk price of around about 32 pence per litre. It's a milk price that's calculated on the basis of the cost of production um, of the group of producers who supply milk to Tesco. That price is reviewed every six months. Okay. John Richardson. Good morning. Uh, we buy all our milk from Graham's, uh, the family dairy, who were here last week. Uh, they pay um, their farmers 26.5p pence per litre. Thank you. James Bailey. Uh, we have a Sainsbury's Dairy Development Group, 310 farmers, 32 of which in Scotland we pay 31.6 pence per litre, and that is paid to every single farmer regardless of the volume they produce. And uh, Bjorn. Good morning, Katrina. Um I buy all my milk through Graham's Dairies, the family business in Scotland, and currently I think they pay 26.5 pence per litre farm gate price. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Duncan Sinclair. Good morning, convener and, and committee. Um, at Waitrose, we've had a dedicated, segregated group in place for 15 years. 
we meet regularly with the steering group, uh, with uh, the 100 odd dairy farmers that we work with. And at the moment, on our conventional milk, we're paying 33.1 pence a litre. Thank you very much for that. That gives us an idea of the spread of these things just now. Um, price volatility is a problem for dairy farmers. Uh, can the supermarkets say uh, what their farm gate prices have been over the past few years? How much volatility has there been at your, in your own farm gate prices? Anyone like to start? Well, answer on behalf of Sainsbury's um, convener. Uh, since we introduced our cost of production model in 2012, we, uh, if you look at our price versus the market price, we believe there's been half the volatility in our milk price versus the UK spot price. So we, anecdotally, we suggest we've halved the volatility for our pool of, of farmers. So is the spot price the measure against which the volatility is measured? I think it's the volatility you're probably referring to in this inquiry, yes. Yes, it is. Any, any other comments? Uh, yes, Steve McLean. Um, I, I can only talk about, you know, from, a, from a Scottish context, um, because our price is linked to cost of production, we've actually removed the volatility through um, market um, changes. But if I look at the, the average market price since Marks & Spencer established its milk pool, which was the first reta retailer to establish the pool, we've paid our producers in Scotland over £2 million over that period above the average market price during that time. So we think that's a fairly significant um, indication as to how we've removed the volatility from the marketplace. Anyone else? Tom Hind, yeah. I think, um, again, given that we review our milk price every six months and it's based on the, based on the cost of production, we've also helped to remove some of the volatility associated with, with market pricing over the course of the last few years and give our dairy farmers a greater sense of predictability and certainty that allows them to, uh, to, make, to make investments. Over that period of time, the investment that we would have made relative to the DEFRA farm gate average milk prices is over, 150, over £150 million. Pounds. I don't have the exact figures, figures to hand. But I think the important thing is, in, through that relationship and through the, uh, the approach that we take, we've been able to, some of the, the volatility to be removed but not completely eliminated. Um, yes, Callum Kirk. Um, similar to my colleagues, um, the Cooperative Group has also um, removed a lot of the volatility by having a index based upon two cost of production methodologies. Um, at current rates, we would be in, within a Scottish farming base, 34 Scottish farmers. Um, we would be um, adding over and above the market price of over £1.3 million as it currently stands to those 34 farmers. Um, also of note is that when the farm gate price has been most under pressure from, say, 2012, um, it was very evident, and I have to share the evidence after this meeting, that the cooperative group has increased um, the premium paid to farmers in more volatile, t more volatile times. Okay. Uh, Mike Russell wants to ask a supplementary here, my colleague. Uh, uh, when we had evidence... Uh, good morning, gentlemen. It, when we had evidence yesterday from two other supermarkets, they were very dismissive about their influence on milk prices, uh, indicating essentially that this was all to do with a global phenomenon which they could not influence. You're telling us something very different. You're indicating that whilst there is volatility, you are able to smooth that volatility out for the people who supply directly to you. Um, would that be a correct interpretation? I mean, there's some volatility, but you have smoothed it out for the people you have a long-term relationship with. Yeah, that's probably an accurate description. I think retailers can make a choice to uh, a choice of how they pay their farmers or what their farmers get paid. Um, and so there are several people around this table who made the choice to pay a cost of production model, different models, but a similar uh, idea. And that does take control of the price away from the processes and means that you can insert some stability in the pricing. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Duncan. On this very point, I mean, our, our model would be similar to others in the sense that we have a discussion around cost production and the proportion of money that's needed for investment. Because um, one of the things we've experienced is, uh, as our business is, is growing and continues to grow, we need to make sure we're going to have that security of supply as we invest in new retail space, new capacity, different mediums of getting to our customers. So, 
you know, milk is one of these key products, and hence that's why, you know, in our discussions with the farmers, it's absolutely essential that we're paying a fair, a fair price to the farmers so that they have the confidence to make that investment. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Steve uh, McLean. Yeah, I, I think, again, if you go back to the reasons that Marks & Spencer established the first aligned retail milk pool, it was at the bequest of producers at that time who were seeing increasing volatility and wanted to work with us at that time to try and find a model that uh, reduced it. I think we're certainly very proud of what we've achieved in that period of time, and I know that the feedback we get from producers, it's, uh, it's enabled them to have the confidence to invest in their businesses and to innovate and to produce products which are different from the rest of the high street. So it's a model that works very well for us. Thank you. Um, we're interested very much in uh, transparency for the farmers and for the customers in the milk supply chain. Is this important to you as uh, retailers? And how do you ensure transparency, if you have any transparency in this? Because much of what you're telling us today is news. Tom Hind. In relation to our dairy, sustainable dairy group, I, we're, we're, we're very transparent in the sense that the, the, the relationship that we have with our dairy farmers is communicated through, through our website to, to our customers. So there's, uh, there's information about how we work with our dairy farmers. We, we recently posted a, a blog from the chairman of the, the TSDG committee, a Scottish dairy farmer called, uh, called James Stevens, that explains his relationship uh, with, with our business. Uh, and our customers are keen to understand that, 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 that information as well. I think more broadly, in term, from a farming point of view, what matters is they understand how the price that they'll receive is going to be calculated, and the process which they undergo to receive that is, is I think, from a farming point of view, is, is, is transparent as well. So do customers get to see this website? Um, is it something that's widely advertised? It's publicly available, and we can send details to the committee um, after this meeting. That's quite interesting, yeah. Anyone else on this point? Uh, yes, Calm Kirk. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's important. We, we believe in fair value, um, essentially from farm to fridge. Um, and similar to my colleague, um, we remain committed and proud of um, the role in the cooperative group play in developing a long-term sustainable Scottish dairy agriculture. Um, to that effect, and I can leave a copy with you, we produce a series of commitments um, and our responsibilities and obligations to that, to, to that very point. Um, so we, we feel, yes, it's, it's fundamentally important for high levels of visibility and high levels of end customer awareness. Okay. Um, Steve McLean, James Bailey, and then a supplementary from Alec Ferguson. Um, I, I, again, to a degree in common with, with um, um, the other retailers in the room here, we, we do genuinely believe about transparent relationships. It's part of our plan A commitments. It's part of our commitment to fair partner. Um, we have a model which we run monthly, um, continually looking at the cost of productions. It's communicated with all the farmers in our dairy pool. Um, we, as I've said before, we change the price six monthly based on uh, those indices. Um, the farmers know exactly what's coming, but I think more importantly, to the side of that, we have a tripartite arrangement between ourselves, our uh, processor, and farmer reps where we sit down regularly at least once a month um, where we go through a number of things, price being one of them, but also the opportunity to innovate and move our milk forward. So, James Bailey? Um, yeah, I, I would concur. I think transparency is a very important part of this conversation. Um, we take it seriously enough. I think you referred to our advert a couple of weeks ago where we published our own and everyone else's milk price, which is one way of being transparent. Um, uh, but we do think that's about having informed customers and informed customers can make informed choices. So, um, I mean, I'd, my only supplementary point would be I would, um, I would include in that transparency other buyers of milk. So I think by some estimates around a fifth of all the milk bought in liquid milk bought in Scotland actually goes through food processes and, and, and in fact is purchased by the public sector. So I would extend that transparency suggestion to all sectors that buy milk. Uh, Duncan Sinclair, before uh, Alec Ferguson asks his supplementary, and Graham Day follows, I think. Yeah, Duncan. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, we, we we very firmly believe that um, you know the way our system works, work, working with the farmers, we set the price in conjunction with the farmers. 
not with uh, not with our processor, because we have that dialogue direct with them, and we've got the steering group that we regularly meet with, and we have an operational uh, meet meeting ev every month, so that some of these aspects are reviewed. Um, so it's vitally important, and you know, coming back as others have said, it's vitally important to be able to communicate that to your customer base. Um, and in our internal magazine, Waitress Weekend, um, and over the last few weeks, we've had some articles explaining what we are doing to support our dairy farmers, and another one will be in this week. So we can, we can send copies of that to the committee. Okay, very helpful indeed. Uh, Alec Ferguson has a uh, question. May I apologise, gentlemen, for being a little late to, to this particular session. Um, uh, no choice in that matter, I'm afraid, but I do apologise. Um, I know that a number of you, and you've already referred to the fact that you have uh, a, a group of, of dairy producers who supply directly to you with, a, uh, with, with their own contracts. Um, what I'm keen to find out is what percentage of the particularly liquid milk that you sell comes from that group of dedicated farmers and what percentage comes from other routes. Um, and on top of that, uh, just when I came in, you were talking about smoothing out the volatility of prices, and I just wonder what extent that refers purely to your direct group of suppliers rather than the, 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 the others who are trying to compete in this currently oversupplied market. So, so what percentage of your liquid product comes from your direct suppliers, uh, and does, do, do your smoothing out initiatives only apply to them? Um, Steve McLean. Um, a really easy answer for me. It's 100 per cent. It's an easy answer for us as well, in the sense that all, all of our own label fresh milk, with the exception of organic, is bought from the Tesco Sustainable Dairy Group and paid at the cost of production price. Pretty simple, similar answer. 97 per cent of our um, fresh liquid milk comes from that pool. It's 97% because we can't cover the seasonal ups and downs mm. of our demand, but mm. it would be if we could. From the cooperative group, it's a very similar answer. It's well in excess of 90%. To then, again, because we um, commit to take all milk from our farmers, we need to have the flexibility for um, seasonal spikes in production. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Obviously, we don't uh, have a cost production model, um, but all of our products does come from Graham's, so who uh, we partly chose because of the support they show compared to the other processors and the price they pay the farmer, they pay the most. Um, and 100% of the milk that we sell in stores comes from Graham's, and it's all 100% Scottish. Yeah, thank you. Bjorn Neerhouse? Equally, all the milk that I sell in Scotland comes from Graham's, the family dairy. Um, I know Graham's pay above uh, the uh, farm gate price compared to other processors. All of our milk in Scotland is 100% Scottish as well, and um, they manage the relationship with their farmers, and they have done so for us for 15 years. I've myself negotiated with the Graham's family for 10 years, with the senior first, with the junior now, and um, I hope that, uh, that there's a good relationship. It certainly is for little. Thank you. Thank um, you very much, gentlemen. And uh, Graham D has a short supplement. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, sorry, um, Waitrose, uh, Duncan Sinclair, on the, the point about uh, the pool or what price is paid to uh, all farmers that supply you? That comes from our, our dedicated groups. I'm sorry, we missed uh, a little bit earlier on at the start of your answer because of a technical matter here. Sorry. I Yep. A hundred percent of our uh, liquid yep. milk and cream comes from yep. the dedicated groups. And in Scotland, while well, we've only got six branches and we're a relatively new retailer to, to Scotland, uh, we do have two farms supplying us through Graham's Dairies. Uh, Graham Day would like to ask a question. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you and good morning, gentlemen. Just in, in relation to um, the reference to the Sainsbury's advert on milk price, the issue of transparency, and where you perceive the public to be on this issue. Do you think the public's choice of where they'll purchase milk from will be influenced by how fairly that retailer treats the supplier, or do they simply want it as cheaply as possible? James Bailey. 
Um, well, I think we just wasted a couple of hundred thousand pounds on some adverts if we don't. So, um, yes, we hope they do because, as some of the other panellists have said, it's a considerable investment we make, and we make that investment because we think having values in your supply chain is important to our customers and to the customers at large. So, And that's why transparency and, and exposing those values and making sure that the customers are well informed is important. Um, Callum Kirk and then Steve. Um, while we would like to think it is a sole decision-making process, unfortunately it's not. Um, um, and it undoubtedly is a contributing factor to where customers will buy milk. But um, the price of milk, um, which um, has been reduced quite significantly in the market, less so within the cooperative group because we believe we should hold value to a valuable commodity, our biggest selling line. Um, it is, there was evidence to suggest that there was volume loss where at first we were slightly uncompetitive at the early stages of this recent retail price movements. And Steve McLean? Um, we think it is um, um, an, an important part. We think that customers in, in general do want to ensure that as a, a responsible retailer, we're doing the right thing by the people in our supply chain. Um, I think you do have to then link it to the fact that um, you know, we're offering a, a milk that's got 6% less saturated fat. So we're trying to innovate the product to create a different demand for it as well. No further cut. Yeah. What about the discount of us? Where do you sit with us? Um, that it is important to consumers uh, on, the, on the price that we pay for the milk, but also... Um, and, and all the other Scottish products that we sell. Um, but there are a large number of customers who are very financially restrained, and the price of the milk and the price of the products is also very, very important to them. Um, and if the price was higher, um, that could affect volume. Um, and indeed, the, the price uh, that we've been selling it at, we've seen huge volume increases over the last five years um, because of the value of the offer to the customer. Um, you know, there have been very, five very challenging years um, and we've been trying to support uh, the customers through that period. Thank Thanks very much for that. Uh, the next question uh, from Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Convener. Um, as you'll be aware, one of the key reasons we wanted to have this series of uh, witness sessions is to look at the issue of volatility and to look at the future. And um, everybody says, well, in 10 years the future is going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, the question is, how do dairy producers survive? What is a really uncertain time for them? And I wanted to ask about to what extent do you support farmers in terms of helping them be more resilient and be more efficient? Um, and in written evidence, the co-op told us um, they didn't want to just look at price in isolation. Um, and they had a series of measures in place um, helping farmers increase their efficiency and reduce the cost of production doing that through professionally facilitated workshops and farm management and access to low-cost energy and supporting um, two vet visits to each farm per year. Now, when I asked that question yesterday, it turned out it's not entirely unique and that other people do different variations on a theme. So I was wondering what kind of support um, different uh, supermarkets do supply um, to the, the farmers and the groups that produce the milk that you buy. Tom Hind. I think a, cu a couple of things. A couple of things here. F first of all, it is important to, to recognise that volatility is a fact of life and will remain a fact of life. And um, there are challenges that farmers face in dealing with that. And we can do something about it in terms of our, our pricing relationship, but we can't can't do everything ar everything around it. And the industry has restructured quite significantly over over a number of years, and probably will continue to do so as well. What we have done in conjunction with our sustainable dairy group is work in partnership with our milk processors and Liverpool University um, on, uh, uh, on, on an applied research facility uh, at Liverpool University. It's a working dairy farm uh, where we work with our dairy farmers on a number of joint uh, research projects, primarily focused in animal health and welfare given that our customers are concerned to ensure that cows are well, are well looked after, but also the fruits of that research which are disseminated across our producers can, of course, help them to improve their own business performance. And that is an area where I think we will look to do more in terms of how we work more closely with our dairy farmers so that we can have not only uh, a group of farmers who have a really strong relationship and partnership with Tesco, um, but also uh, they're a group of dairy farmers that are efficient and resilient to the future challenges that lie ahead. 
Any other members wish to comment just now? Steve McLean. Yeah, I, I think, um, not just common to, to dairy, but we've got a, a, a fairly well-recognised programme called Farming for the Future, which is really um, about working with our uh, supply chains and looking at how we can work together to improve farm efficiency, um, the environmental impact, and um, a term we call ethics, which is really about people and about the animals um, in the supply chain. And we've got a rolling programme where we have funded um, a series of indicator farms across the different sectors, and we funded innovation projects on those farms to try and improve um, the overall efficiency, impact, and effect of the farms. And like, uh, as I've said several times too, we do link that to trying to create systems and products which are different from the rest of the high street. Um, that's how we operate, that's what our business model is about, and it's something we're very proud of what we've achieved. Uh, Duncan Sinclair, you wish to answer yeah, on this? Not... Yeah, yeah thank, thanks. Um, I mean, across um, all our livestock supply chains, we have a range of activity under the banner of the, the Waitrose Farming Partnership. So just a couple of examples um, that we've, we've got underway. Uh, on the dairy group and across all livestock, we have an initiative with Anglia Farmers, which provides the opportunity for all our farmer suppliers to work together to get better, uh, smarter deals on all, a whole range of farm inputs. And on the conventional milk group, that's become compulsory, a decision taken by the farmers and the steering group, seeing the merit of that and seeing that as a means of working together, collaborating and getting a better deal for, for everyone. We've got a £2 million TSB-funded project at growing more home-produced protein. We recognise that volatility in feed, mar feed markets around the world have a big bearing, particularly on dairy as well as the, the monogastric sectors, and that's setting a target of becoming much more self-sufficient in producing more home-produced protein and reducing reliance on soya, for example. And in that project, we've got both an organic and a conventional dairy farm involved, as well as three beef and three lamb farms. I think some of the other areas we're adding value is in the area of animal health. And unlike in Scotland, where you've got a comprehensive national BVD eradication program, across our, both our dairy groups, we've put in place a BVD eradication scheme, uh, which is a three-year project we've put in train, um, and the two farms in Scotland are naturally ahead of the game there because they're part of um, the national scheme in Scotland. And the other area that we're particularly proud of is the work we've done at finding solutions for dairy bull calves, uh, an opportunity to add value there, where on the herds not under TB restriction, we're using these dairy bull calves for production of veal and linking that through to our beef processor. So the dairy uh, for the black and white bull calves, they mostly go off for veal production, and surplus beef uh, cross calves are, 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 are moved through uh, a dedicated calf rearing scheme uh, and then reared uh, and end up coming to us as finished cattle. So a range of options available to our dairy farms in addition to the price we pay for the milk in terms of trying to add value. Thank you. Uh, James Bailey. Um, yeah, I, I would probably make a link between sustainability in the future and efficient farming. And I think one of the things that's really... Um, uh, made an impression on us and our dairy group so far has been when we kicked off the group in 2007 we set up a data sharing system and we pay for vet visits in the same way that lots of other of the um, people around this table do and for environmental consultant visits to those farms every year we collect lots of data points on herd welfare and environmental measures and what the farmers are able to do by sharing that data anon anonymously and benchmarking they're able to share best practice and see what's possible on the best farms. And what we found actually in our Scottish farms is, is a rather remarkable improvement in efficiency, more than 10, 15, 20% in terms of the yield you're able to achieve from your herd and the um, cost of production improvements that you're able to achieve just from benchmarking and sharing best practice. And it's one of the things, if the, gov if the um, Scottish Parliament or this inquiry was uh, supportive in it and wanted to support farming in the future, it's one of the things we'd really recommend having a more... Uh, inclusive version of. Thank you very much. Um, a question from Mike Russell. Yes, I, mean, I, I think it, it's fair to say that those farmers who are in the fortunate position of being reasonably proximity to uh, yourselves and supply you directly 
are probably, if I may use this term without being uh, too facetious, the cream of the crop. I represent a, a rural area where First Milk is the only um, processor uh, that, that is able to collect milk in Kintyre and, and Butte. Um, the price there is, well, the prices you've given, at the very lowest of the prices, is about, from the 1st of February, 8 pence, roughly, less than the price that you've given. The only hope for uh, many of those farmers is to make sure that the cheese that is produced, for example, uh, is a premium product that sells well uh, in your stores. Now, searching, I, I'm sorry, uh, Tom Hine, to use this as an example, but searching for Mull of Kintyre Cheddar in Tesco in Oban last week, uh, there was one small container lurking at the back of a dimly lit shelf. Um, we are not, they are not getting their product into the supermarkets in the way that they need to. And therefore, those dairy farmers, who might, one might argue are you know, very crucial to the survival of parts of rural Scotland, are not being well served. What role can you play in promoting Scottish uh, dairy products? Not just uh, cheese, though that is important. Clearly, Graham's has led the way in, in, in spreadable butter, and that's very important. But there will be other uh, innovations that need to be made too, although there's a remarkable lack of innovation in the small-scale uh, dairy products market in Scotland. What can you do, what are you doing, and, and what would you intend to do to assist in this way? So, Callum Kirk. That um, question in two parts, please. Um, firstly, as a Campbelltown man, I, I fully um, affiliate to the region and area, and, and I'm delighted to say that all of the Scottish cheese you will find in cooperative Scottish stores is actually processed and produced in Campbelltown. So that um, is a significant commitment to the, the Kintyre Peninsula and those areas. We also have a number of um, direct relationships um, with some of our smaller producers in Orkney, Shetland, also where we actively support those brands. In terms of adding value to that particular um, area of the country, we did have, and unfortunately removed because it didn't sell particularly well, a specific Mull of Kintyre premium product. And I would thoroughly recommend the, the likes of First Milk um, Consider more closely, certainly speaking on behalf of the cooperative group, the, uh, the customer requirements and the customer missions for visiting convenience stores and bring to us and share with us, and, and we will share ideas with First Milk, um, ways in which we can add value through cheese and in particular the area in which you represent. Um, the cooperative group sees many blocks of cheese in a different wrapper. What the cooperative group is looking for is to add value to support um, the advocacy of such dairy producing areas with products which are relevant to today's customer solutions and the reasons why which customers come into a convenience store. Uh, Bjorn Nyerhaus. For them making this point, because I do believe that um, it is key really for, for Scottish agriculture, agriculture as a whole, to develop new products, uh, to develop uh, added value products and not to only concentrate on fresh milk. There's an oversupply on milk and um, forms of exporting basically this milk into the rest of the UK or even into Europe ne are needed. Um, I actually listed Moloch and Tired Cheese at Little in 2009 when it was still managed by First Milk myself. Um, and uh, there are many other products that I think the Scottish industry, food industry needs to look at, whether it's ice cream, uh, all dairy ice cream, yogurts that need to be developed and so on and so forth. And that would really, really help rural Scotland. And you would be able to stocking those if they I, were I'm, done I'm, in the right way and I'm, I'm not negotiating with you. I'm just no, 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 <laughs> I wouldn't. Um, I'd, 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 I'm, I'm always happy when I'm being approached by suppliers with good products that are uh, vendable and be it um, branded products or own label products. We sell butter all across the UK. I don't see why that shouldn't come from Scotland necessarily or why own label yogurts shouldn't come from Scotland. I think the key for development is to add value for, uh, to the products. But um, I think, as uh, Robert Jr. said last week, that needs investment in the industry, in the food processing, and that is very important. Um, Tom Hind and then John Richardson. 
Scotland's got a great story to tell uh, on, on food and drink. It's well supported by the Scottish Government, well supported by uh, organisations like Scotland Food and Drink. But as my fellow panellists have argued, in terms of the dairy sector, there is something of a challenge about ensuring that the necessary investment takes place in customer-facing um, products that add more value to raw milk as opposed to all of the investment being in fresh liquid milk, which has probably been the case over the course of the last, uh, last 10 years or so. From our point of view as, as Tesco, we, uh, we're really proud of our support for Scottish food and Scottish agriculture. We're Scottish agriculture's biggest customer. We work with 170 suppliers uh, across Scotland, not only to sell store, uh, products in our Scottish stores, including um, 80, uh, 80 stores in Scotland selling Mull of Kintyre cheddar, uh, but we're also using our scale as a business to bring more of those products south of the border into the rest of the UK as well. Um, we're also partnering with Scotland Food and Drink on the Scotland uh, year of uh, uh, food and drink this year as well. So I think that's some, some of the contribution that we can make to help extending the reach of uh, um, excellent food products that are produced here in Scotland. John, hey, James, uh, sorry, John. Unfortunately, we don't uh, stock branded products. Um, we are pretty much 100% focused on own label products, um, but would obviously welcome the opportunity to get Muller Kintyre as a, an own label. Um, of our block cheddar, uh, our block cheeses, with the exception of Red, Lister, Red Leicester, it is 100% Scottish. Uh, our block butter is 100% Scottish. Um, on top of the, um, all the block cheese being Scottish, we also, which is from Lockerbie um, and from Dumfries and Galloway, um, we stock cheeses from Highland Fine Cheeses, from Connage uh, and from Orkney. So we have a very extensive range. And when we can stock Scottish, we do stock Scottish. And that is across the range. Um, as far as bringing those products to the market, we have tripled the size of our buying department in Scotland in the last two years. Uh, and indeed, now more than 30% of our sales come from Scottish sourced products. Um, which is a very high percentage. Uh, okay. uh, Steve and Duncan. Uh, Steve uh, McLean, first of all, Duncan uh, Sinclair, and then uh, Graham Day as a supplementary. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to a degree supporting what um, our competitors around the table here um, are saying. For, for us, um, I think it's an important point to make that we have long established partnerships with uh, processors in Scotland across all the different sectors. Um, we take about 2,500 Scottish products into M&S stores, not just in Scotland, um, through our estate uh, worldwide now. Looking specifically at, at um, dairy products, and unfortunately we don't, we don't deal um, with, uh, with Kintyre, but we have got partnerships with a number of really interesting companies who've devised products that are very different. So if I look at Rowan Glen, um, Dale Farm Rowan Glen, we've developed Active Health strawberry yogurt drinks, we've delivered cholesterol-lowering uh, cholesterol vanilla drinks, um, a number of products like that. We've also tried to innovate traditional products, so um, First Milk, uh, we've got a range of different cottage cheeses, uh, onion chive, pineapple prawn, all things that add value and make the product very different from, from typical. Now, we can't, unfortunately, support every dairy farmer, much though we would like to. Um, there is a kind of harsh reality as to where the industry sits at the moment through the change in global demand um, and the issues around some markets having been closed for different, different reasons. But we are fairly fixed and have a, a very strong view that if we can help the industry become more efficient become more innovative and market the products better, it will be to the benefit of Scotland. And certainly from a Marks & Spencer's point of view, we're always looking for new products. Um, we have a policy of ensuring that we've got newness all the time and there is never a closed door if somebody's got the right product for us. Uh, and so, Duncan Sinclair, please. Um, as the second uh, son of Kintyre, um, given evidence this morning, uh, convener, um, I'm delighted to say that at, at Waitrose we've got Mull of Kintyre, around 75% of our branches uh, across Great Britain, uh, and products like Seriously Strong, um, Scottish Cheddar, we've got that across the, the entire estate. Uh, where, where we work particularly well with the Scottish industry, like others who have, who have uh, made similar contributions, is when we've been opening new stores, working very closely with um, Scottish Food and Drink and Meet the Buyer events, looking for new products and to support emerging businesses. Um, and 18 months ago, when we opened in Stirling, uh, for example, we uh, launched a range of yogurts from Katie Rogers, uh, a local supplier in, in that part of the world. 
and tomorrow we've got a meeting with Scottish Food and Drink at another Meet the Buyer event because we're shortly going to open uh, a, a waitress branch in Milgai in, in Glasgow. So looking for that innovation and opportunity to be able to provide um, openings for some of the innovation taking place in the sector. Thank you very much, uh, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, convener. I take just back to Mr. Richardson's comment. I think you said that 100% of all these butter is Scottish. Is that uh, yes? The block butter. That makes me wonder about evidence we've taken previously that suggests that 85% of the butter being sold in Scotland comes from Denmark. Why is that? I mean, is it, is it a lack of available options? It does sound like there is something out there and at a reasonable price. Why are we in a situation um, where such a large percentage of the, certainly the spreadable butter being sold in Scotland is coming from out with our country? Don't stock uh, the spreadable butter uh, that you're talking about um, that doesn't come from Scotland. Um, so because we don't stock the brand. Um, so, but we do stock Graham's spreadable butter. Um, so that, that is our, our main spreadable butter in the store, along with another own label variant. Um, James Bailey and then Steve McLean. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think in that particular case of spreadable butter, it's a quirk of the brands and the brand, sort of the most popular brand happens to be a Danish brand at the moment. I think the work that Robert and his team at Graham's are doing on their own brand and the sales they've achieved in Scotland particularly just demonstrate what you can do with a good brand in the right place at the right time. So, and, and that's good for us and good for our customers, so we'd encourage that. Steve McLean. I, I think, again, I might be in a slightly different um, uh, place than, than some of our competitors here. We, we clearly are an own label um, retailer and our, our block butter um, comes from Lockerbie, as does our cheddars in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, a further question? Okay, um, so Jim Hume. Yes, uh, th thanks very much and good morning uh, everyone. Uh, last week we heard from one of our uh, uh, people giving us evidence uh, that there was anecdotal evidence of a number of practices uh, with supermarkets who were actually requesting payment for shelf space and uh, that some uh, suppliers uh, needed to actually pay some supermarkets for the right to tender contracts. I've, of course, we've just heard this morning that there's reasonable suspic suspicion that, uh, uh, that one of the supermarkets here has actually been delaying payments or paying for better positioning of goods, uh, uh, which has nothing to do with uh, promotion. So, uh, therefore, it would be quite interesting if uh, any of the supermarkets here today have, uh, have the practice that someone has to pay for contracts and has to pay for actual prominent shelf space, out with being special promo promotions. Uh, first of all, t uh, Callum, you want to lead off on this one? Absolutely not the case um, for the cooperative group. And I can cite the most recent example um, where we ran a cheese tender. Our cheese crop compliance officer was actually present with all the suppliers at that particular meeting. Um, so that all was fair, equitable, and within the lines of GSCOP. So, uh, John Richardson and then Tom Hind. Um, we do not uh, charge any uh, additional cost for our suppliers for a number of different things, um, some of which were mentioned earlier this morning. Uh, we do not charge anything for right to tender charge. Uh, we never charge any listing fees. We never charge uh, or have overriders or rebates with any of our suppliers. Uh, we have never... Um, we weren't even aware of forensic auditing until it uh, came out earlier uh, uh, in the news, uh, and we've never charged anybody for the positioning uh, of their product. Uh, it's our job to sell their product. Um, it's our, our job to maximise our sales, no one else's. And uh, Tom Hind? I think, I think you'll, you'll appreciate, as the um, uh, Groceries Code Adjudicator um, mentioned earlier today and the announcement that she made this morning, I'm not going to comment on the specifics of, a, of an investigation, and we're cooperating fully with that and have, uh, and, and have said that we will do and have, uh, and, and have worked very closely with, with the adjudicator. We take the Grocery Supply Chain Code of Practice very seriously. Uh, it's, uh, it's important to the way that we do business in building partnerships with our, uh, with our suppliers for the long term. We have a robust compliance process in place. We're looking, always looking at opportunities opportunities to, to strengthen that so that uh, we, uh, we can uphold both the spirit and the letter of the Grocery Supply Code of Practice. 
Uh, and the Bjorn Neuer House? I can also confirm that we wouldn't um, delay payments or charge for self, uh, shelf space. Uh, shelf space uh, sorry, um, we have uh, direct negotiations with our processes that are fair and square, hard, but certainly um, without hidden uh, agenda. Uh, James Bailey. Um, yeah, I mean, much like my colleagues here, all of the practices you describe or have been mentioned are against the code of practice, and Sainsbury's takes its commitment to the code of practice very seriously. Anyone in our business who comes into contact with any of our suppliers at all has to go through a mandatory annual process of training, and that training has to be signed off and the register kept. So um, we take that commitment very seriously, and so none of those practices we'd recognise. Uh, so we'll have Duncan uh, Sinclair first, and then Steve McLean. Like, like other colleagues, we very much work to the G-Scope requirements um, and wouldn't charge suppliers in this way. And um, like others, it's a mandatory requirement that uh, all, all people in their commercial division, uh, be they buyers or in my role as agricultural manager, we have to undertake them that, that, annual, that training annually. And Steve McLean. G Scope uh, compliant, and um, a bit like Duncan said, we go through regular training. But actually, the practice isn't relevant because we're an own brand retailer. Okay. We'll be interested to see how the grocery code adjudicator uh, goes on with that. That is of our first investigations. Uh, but bearing in mind that we've already heard that uh, you're very much uh, all saying that you uh, want to ensure that the farmer gets a fair price for his. Uh, liquid milk, but of course a lot of, uh, it's not all liquid milk, it's cheesy yogurts, etc. So how do you, the supermarkets um, ensure that the farmer who's um, providing liquid milk into the processors is getting a fair price for their milk, or is that something you don't uh, follow up? James Bailey. Um, well, we do have development groups in other dairy supply chains. So we have a cheese um, development group. We also have an egg development group. We have development groups across lots of different agricultural sectors. Um, and we support that group of about 80 farmers with um, farm investment <coughs> in the form of milk recording, vet visits, and agricultural support. Um, I think in practical terms, where milk is a, is a relatively simple product, there is only one ingredient, essentially, you take it off the farm, you process it, you send it to a shop. With more complicated, more complex production processes, I think it would be the problems we've always run into when we consider um, different ways of working with those farmers is that the, the complexity of the production means it's very difficult to disaggregate the cost of one ingredient versus the others. And if you, if you do start talking about the, trying to regulate the cost of one ingredient, you'd have to start thinking about the costs of the efficiency of the production process itself You'd have to start factoring in things like the cost of the packaging and understand if that was included in this calculation. So it, it becomes very, very difficult to come up with actually a fair and transparent process to do it. Uh, Alec Ferguson, the supplementary. Yeah. Yes, thank you on, 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 the, on, this, on this subject. Um, yesterday we were told um, in evidence by a retailer that um, while they wouldn't dream of uh, charging in any of the ways that we've just been discussing, um, some particularly larger supply, um, suppliers came with I think the expression used was a support package to help uh, promote that product. Now, promoting that product presumably means um, acquiring premium shelf space um, and whatever. And I just wonder if that's a situation that any of you recognise. John? Uh, not at Ali. We are not aware of any, any suppliers coming us with a, with a package, and uh, we would always only want... Uh, a very straightforward, transparent price for the product, and that would be the end of the, the discussion. No further comment. No. Steve McLean? Yeah. Applied to one particular retailer, is that what um, you're telling us? Sorry, from my from, from right Spencer, again, I, because we're a known brand retailer, it's a, it's a very different uh, uh, playing field. Yeah. I can see the difference, absolutely. So we don't, yeah. Yeah. No, I just find yeah. it interesting. Thank you for your, for your silence, I think. Okay, all right with you, Jim. Right. Um, as you know, we've been taking evidence from the grocery code adjudicator. Um, from, the, from the point of view of supermarkets, what impact has the establishment of the grocery code adjudicator had on your operations uh, in recent years? Bjorn? Um, 
when the grocery, uh, grocery code of ju uh, adjudicator um, was introduced, uh, I actually uh, only noticed uh, what other methods there were being used. Um, it thus didn't have any impact on our very straightforward dealing with the suppliers because uh, I didn't know about the mechanisms that uh, seemed to have been prevalent or available on the market. Um, again, I do prefer straightforward negotiation um, and uh, clear settlement rather than um, strange, uh, strange uh, uh, paybacks. Okay, Tom Hind. I think, as I said before, we, we have a, a very strong collaborative relationship with the Groceries Code Adjudicator. We meet with the, uh, the Code Adjudicator regularly, um, and uh, we, we think it's important to, um, to, to have, have that relationship and to work cooperatively with, with the Adjudicator. Thank you very much. Um, how, you know, the EFRA committee has suggested that uh, there might be an extension in the role of the uh, grocery code adjudicator. How do you think that would affect you and how you source your dairy products, including liquid milk? Steve McLean. Um, I think on the liquid milk one, um, I wouldn't see any change. We would believe we're doing the right thing anyway. I think when you do go further down the chain, it would be interesting to understand the complexity and how that would actually pan out, but I think the principle um, of what that potentially um, could do um, would seem logical. Um, just need to understand how it would actually work and, and what the mechanisms of it would be. Well, we're all at that stage at the moment, but uh, mm. since you're the people most affected, it would be very interesting to get points of view. James Bailey? You go further down the line of I, I, I'm not sure how it would work in practice we'd have to we'd have to be involved somehow in the contracting process of our first tier suppliers with everyone else they contract with so as I said before in liquid milk that that is less complicated um, but you also have the voluntary code of practice in place which which deals with most of the contract the terms of contract that you would the, the preferential terms of contract you, you would want in a dairy a farmer and processor Relationship, and I'm not sure what I'm not sure that the, that the extending the code, the grocery code of practice to that layer would make a great deal of difference to it. As the adjudicator said, the um, the code of practice doesn't have any remit in terms of price, and that's actually the more sort of prevalent issue for a lot of the dairy farmers at the moment. So, in terms of practicality and the, and the effect it could have, I'm not sure it would do any good. We're going to bring in Duncan uh, Sinclair and then a supplementary from Mike Russell. Duncan. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've also always been very supportive of the establishment of the GCA from the outset. Um, and, you know, if there are any proposals to extend, that's something that we would be keen to review um, as, as a business. But uh, we would be very comfortable and confident that the way we're, we work with our supply base, um, then it wouldn't pose any major issue that we could foresee it as we stand today. Okay, thank you. Mike Russell? I think the focus of this inquiry is the dairy industry. It doesn't go any wider than that. But you know, we, we heard from the grocery code adjudicator this morning in a series of her top five issues, which I have to say, having led a sheltered life, made my hair curl, the, the, the accusations that we should make about things were happening. Can we just clear this off in terms of the dairy industry? You are all saying quite clearly, as far as I understand it, that you do not recognise any of those practices as things that are affecting the dairy industry and the dairy market as it exists now? Steve McLean. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, as, as the adjudicator um, laid them out, they were new to me, some of them, um, as well, certainly having um, you know, heard them laid out like that. I don't believe they're practices that we're aware of at all in our supply chains. Uh, Bjorn Neuhaus. These practices are new to me and uh, certainly don't reflect the way we at Little do business. Uh, James Bailey? Yeah, I mean, I'd refer to the earlier answer there against the code of practice, so we go to strenuous efforts not to breach that code of practice. So um, they're, not re they're not practices we'd recognise, and milk is a fast-moving product. We have a daily relationship with our processors, um, and, and so that some of, those, some of the things in terms of delaying payments just almost can't exist because of the way the process works. Does Tom Hind wish to make any comment? 
I'm not in a position to comment given my area, given my area of the yeah. business. I think the adjudicator indicated earlier that she's been working collaboratively with, yeah. with a number of retailers to, to work on how, how issues that she's identified wherever they may be, may be can be addressed. Duncan Sinclair. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware of the, the five points that was made by the adjudicator earlier, so if that could be shared with us, we could come back to um, the committee directly with our thoughts. Thank you. We will send you those uh, on the official report. Um, they've obviously got longer-term implications. Did Mike Russell have further? No, I'm, I'm quite happy. I, they were new to me, too. I'd only read about them and seen them in films like The Godfather, I think, really. I think <laughs> what they were like. Indeed. Um, Claudia Beamish, uh, some wider matters. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. Good, good morning to you all. Uh, I'd like to turn our minds to possible government intervention at a whole range of levels. And in written and oral evidence, a range of actions have been suggested at Scottish, UK and EU level, and such as addressing planning problems, facing investment in processing, uh, promoting export and possibly home market opportunities, and reducing... Or, or altering the EU intervention price for milk. Uh, would any of the witnesses giving evidence today um, want to see particular actions taken by Scottish or UK government or at, at a UK level, specifically um, in terms of this inquiry, to address current issues in the dairy sector? And if so, what would those be? Tom Hind focused on on delivering for our for our customers so th these are really really matters for the government but in the past we we have talked about the importance of ensuring that that there is a there is a, in effect a kind of national food plan that that helps to ensure that the whole uk agri-food industry can improve its capability and capacity to produce more affordable food more sustainably to to supply cust customers in the long term that's a re real challenge it probably encompasses a number of different areas but as far, as far as we're concerned we're really really focused on delivering great great quality products to our customers yep particular point um th thank you convener you you say that it's about delivering to for your customers where do your responsibilities lie further down the the supply chain then can you highlight that for us please from your perspective I think it's really important that we have long-term sustainable partnerships with, with our suppliers. And the part of the, the, the Tesco business that I'm involved in in terms of agriculture is about how do we strengthen those relationships and take them further back to farmers because we recognise, one, it matters to our customers. They want to ensure that we're trading and working responsibly as a retailer. But also we're very mindful that if we want to secure supply from the best farmers, the most invested farmers, the ones who are most innovative and dynamic, then we have to build stronger relationships with them and move towards a partnership model. Thank you. Uh, James Bailey. Um, I'd probably pick on a couple of potential things that the um, <laughs> government could do. Uh, I would I'd refer you back to um, Robert's evidence last week in terms of planning and investment in the dairy sector. I think you have some fantastic um, Scottish dairy brands, but also Scottish food brands who are incredibly successful and they're well-invested businesses. Anything I guess you can do to support the next generation uh, in getting through to that mid-size mid and large size would be of benefit. I think in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll probably come back to the subject of transparency and information. So anything the government can do to improve the transparency of customer information, so you have informed customers making informed choices, would, would I think give the customers the chance to vote with their wallet, which is the one thing that tends to move the market the fastest. Um, and, and, you know, one obvious example... I would raise would be the idea that if you're going to call something Scottish or put a Scottish flag on it, that product should have started and finished in Scotland rather than just finished in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, the rules are relatively relaxed. Sainsbury's takes the position that we wouldn't put the word Scottish or the flag on anything that was sourced external Scotland but packaged or finally produced in Scotland. I think if you, if you tightened the rules and said that it had to start and finish in Scotland to be called Scottish or have a Scottish flag on it, that would help inform customers and help them support the industry. Thank you. Did we know through QMS and so on the kind of work that's been done in that direction with regard to beef, etc.? But uh, it's quite a, a difficult area to, to bring about. Um, several people want to come in on this. I'm trying to keep the answer short, please. Duncan, uh, first of all, please. Duncan Sinclair. Yeah, um, I mean, the focus for us is very much about 
working with, with, with the farmers and our supply base um, and, and as we continue to grow, provide an opportunity through that, w that way. So that very much is our internal, um, internal focus. I think at, at, at farm level, planning, particularly in relation to adding new capacity, um, as farms seek to capitalise on growing their business in tandem with us, is becoming more challenging. Um, so that's maybe an area that's worth looking at, as well as some of the tax breaks that might be available in terms of some of the investment as well. Thank you very much. Um, we've uh, done a, a major round of uh, activities. Oh, one more here. Callum? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. You, on this question. Thank you, Kavina. There was, there was two points I, I, I noted, and it would be interesting to see the Minister's progress in terms of labelling, um, and like my, my learned colleague here, um, the progress that could be made in terms of how and how we serve our customers and the, what the advocacy actually stands for, both at a national, i.e. Scottish, and then perhaps more local level as well. Uh, and we welcome any um, opportunities or feedback from the Minister on progress to that. Um, Secondly, um, we see it as a privilege to serve our Scottish customers in the cooperative group, and um, it would be most interesting to see the developments around the Scottish brand that was made reference to over the last couple of sessions uh, and how that um, will articulate itself, and in particular to a Scottish convenience customer for the business I represent. Thank you very much. Um, generally, we've been uh, pursuing uh, many of the issues around the problems that there are for the dairy industry at the moment, We'd like to try and uh, finish on a note where we're thinking about the future. Some of you have made some hints about that already. Uh, we've got a couple of points here from members that they wish to raise. Uh, Graham Day. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Very much as a committee in the context of this um, inquiry, looking at how the dairy sector perhaps better positions itself for the future by focusing on the production of more than just liquid milk, by adding some value. Um, I'm wondering what, from your perspective, it possibly exists as barriers to your better promoting Scottish dairy produce. When we asked that question of some of your colleagues yesterday, one of them suggested that there was a growth in the market for salad cheeses, and yet there was no domestic source of this. So, um, so are there any other areas you feel that we're coming up short in Scotland and we should be looking to address? John Richardson. So are you talking particularly about dairy? Mm -hmm. Within dairy, um, we find it very challenging to source uh, Scottish yoghurt. So we have yoghurt um, from Newton Stewart, um, which um, actually is branded in this instance because we cannot find uh, own label yoghurt. And we um, have in the past had a relationship with the Katie Rogers product, which was mentioned earlier as well, which we did have own label. Um, but yeah, we would welcome um, as many opportunities as possible to source Scottish yoghurt. Okay. Uh, Steve McLean. Um, I, I think if I was looking across raw material coming out of Scotland, and I made that point earlier about the fact that we massively overbuy out of Scotland in raw material, and we buy about £300 million worth uh, of, of product um, a year that goes globally. It does that because it's the right quality and because it hits the requirements and expectations of our customer. And I think doing anything that we can around adding value and innovating product so that you've got a point of difference... Um, is absolutely um, down our street in terms of being able to further increase our buy out of Scotland. Callum Kerr. If I may, um, we, like my um, colleague to my right, also disproportionately um, take Scottish products into the wider chain. 18% of our milk is Scottish, only 10% is consumed within Scotland. The point I would like to make, it, it's for myself, it's not merely the innovation in product, it's the innovation in thinking and innovation in marketing. And that's why in my last comment I made reference to the Scottish brand. And I, I, I wait eagerly to understand the opportunities that have been identified in not merely producing, but um, helping us sell Scottish products through, uh, to our Scottish <coughs> customers. And Tom Hind. I'd echo the remarks of, uh, of, of, of my competitors. Um, but I also uh, believe it's important to, to, to reflect on the position of the, in, of the industry and the farming industry as well. Um, although 
now is a very difficult time for a lot of dairy farmers, given the, the severe de decline in milk price that they've experienced and the volatility of all of that. Um, we should remember that the, the British dairy industry and the Scottish dairy industry as part of that has some of the best, most well-invested, most efficient dairy farmers in the European Union. Um, but it is important that it maintains its competitive advantage in, in the long term. Uh, and that's about making sure that we, we do as an industry benchmark ourselves against um, uh, our other competitors elsewhere in the European Union, find opportunities to become more efficient and, and, and more innovative in future, and, and as, well, as well as creating the market opportunities that allow dairy farmers to put raw materials onto the market that can be processed efficiently and enter markets efficiently and competitively. Duncan Sinclair. I think, I think in this whole area, I think the, the area of innovation is, is important. Um, certainly for, for within our business, um, the whole area of life stage nutrition and where dairy products might have a, an important role is one area that we're carefully uh, looking at at the moment. Um, so, you know, not, not a great deal we can say at this point in time, but certainly the opportunity there in terms of looking at um, dairy products, dairy ingredients, and what that could mean um, is, is, could be an area we would like to explore. Ferguson would like a supplementary. Yes, thank you. And it very much follows on from this point, because I, I think one thing has become totally clear to all of us, uh, if we didn't know it already, is that there remains enormous potential for us here in Scotland to add value to the basic milk product that we produce so well. Um, I, I was struck by, I think it was Callum Kirk who said in relation to the first milk situation in, in Mike Russell's constituency, that you, were, you were, were keen and willing to work with the Creamery at Campbellton to help them produce a product that you would be able to sell more readily, if I can put it that way. And I, I, it just struck me, uh, I just wonder how much work uh, you do proactively in going to processors and say, look, bring us this product and we can sell it, or do you sort of wait for the product to be brought to you and say, well... It's not the one we want or something. I, I just wonder how much proactive um, relationship there is between you guys and the processors. A lot, Callum Kirk, yes. uh, Thank you for that question. Um, as, as a smaller um, in size of store convenience retailer, it's in incredibly important that we have a point of differentiation to some of my competitors around the table. Hence why, um, personally and professionally, um, within the dairy team at the cooperative group, we are incredibly keen to work with producers to find new ideas, um, new innovations, and to bring them, bring them to market. Um, if that means that we need to overinvest time and efforts to do so, then so be it, because we feel it's absolutely our role um, to do so. So we welcome that opportunity, and I would reiterate the offer to work with any processors, including um, our, our colleagues in Kintyre in, in bringing, bringing new innovation to the market. It's, it's a very, very important part of having a long-term sustainable relationship with our dairy producers and our dairy farmers. Uh, Tom Hind. It is very much a two-way two street. Um, we we, we we'll act actively seek and encourage, uh, encourage our suppliers to come to us with great quality, fantastic, innovative, but, but also product products that, that, that will sell and are of consistent, consistent quality. And, and it is very much a, a, a partnership. We, we, can, we can offer the insight into, into our customers, what, what they think, what, what, what they're looking for, and we can work with our suppliers to ensure that the products that they're able to offer are the ones that we think will sell to our customers. But it's really, it is really about a partnership. John Richardson. Um, we have a Scottish buying department which is 100% dedicated to sourcing the Scottish products. Uh, they are completely decoupled from the rest of the range. Uh, their remit is to grow the Scottish range uh, so that we can absolutely maximise the number of Scottish products in our store. Every week um, they are out visiting existing suppliers and new suppliers, um, searching for new products that we can put into store uh, going forward. So yeah, we are very focused on that uh, and not distracted by anything else. Thank you. Uh, Steve uh, McLean, uh, we need to be very brief. Hopefully no great surprise, but innovation is the heartblood of our business. If you look at our category teams, a third of the waiting in those teams is about new product development and developers. But it is a joint process. We've got a number of suppliers with relationships over 50 years, so it's a joint process. And uh, James uh, Richardson, uh, sorry, James Bailey. I mean, yeah, I'd echo the comments. We're always looking for new, innovative good selling products that's what our, basically that's our job so it does happen two ways often suppliers come to us with new ideas and often in our conversations we talk about things that we can't get 
in my experience and in my Scottish buying team's experience, Scottish suppliers are innovative and um, proactive, shall we say, in bringing their ideas to us. Thank you. Um, at the cutting edge, I guess, um, uh, because I represent far north of Scotland, uh, we've managed to have ten fine cheeses to sort of save a couple of uh, dairy farms there by taking that for their excellent product that some of you sell. Uh, but it's been suggested to me that uh, sheep milk might be the next sort of development that people start to think about since we have plenty of sheep in the far north and it might be an innovative way of using them. So uh, why go for Roquefort when you could have uh, the sheep milk cheese? Uh, but uh, anyway, we wanted to try and get as wide a view from all of you as possible. I'd like to thank you for your evidence. This inquiry is a short one, but uh, we have learned a huge amount from you uh, about the role of uh, retailers and we will be uh, considering these uh, now. So thank you all for being our witnesses today. Uh, this brings me to the end of the meeting. Uh, before we close, I'd just like to point out that uh, next uh, time we meet that we'll be dealing with the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill at stage two and hearing oral evidence on the Scottish Government's Wild Fisheries Review. I close the meeting now. <laughs>